Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, it's really tricky to approve people as they're coming in as I'm like supposed to be hosting this all at the same time. So I'm going to stop welcoming uh, folks uh, registrations and just focus on on our group here. Um, thanks so much for being here. My name is Ruxandra Guidi. I'm an assistant professor of practice at the School of Journalism at the University of Arizona. I've been here for almost two years. And before then, I've been uh, working as a journalist, mostly as a freelance public radio and magazine journalist for about 20 years. And I'll just say by way of introduction that I, um, I really have believed in unions and have relied on unions my whole career. I started out, one of my first jobs in public radio was at The World, the BBC PRI program, and that was a union job. Uh, it's what allowed me to get paid extra for working nights and the uh, graveyard shift. Um, and then I went on to help start the union at KPCC Public Radio in Los Angeles, and most recently here at the university last year. Yeah, exactly a year ago, we started what's called a wall-to-wall -wall union at the University of Arizona in this right-to-work state, anti-union state. So I'm really proud of, of my union background. And I've been thinking a lot about this, about how uh, journalists are essential workers, about uh, how our industry has really suffered um, in many ways a lot of you know, uh, layoffs, um, lack of funding over the last decade or more, but at the same time, it's seen enormous growth in other, in other aspects. And there seemed to be more opportunity and certainly more opportunity for journalists who are organizing, who are starting unions, who are demanding better pay, better conditions, or who are, you know, basically dreaming up what the future of journalism could be. Um, so that's where this idea to, uh, to have this conversation came about. I've been following the work of all our panelists and I'm just like humbled to, to have you all here to share your personal experiences, any tips, ideas, any insights about how to go about um, organizing in the workplace and, and what the union has done for you, what it could still do for you or for others. Um, so I want to welcome here, uh, Carolina Miranda is with us. She's a Los Angeles Times columnist covering art, architecture, and urban design. She's based in Los Angeles. Uh, Hello. With... Hi, Carolina. Just, I know uh, there's a lot of people on here, so I'm gonna say hi. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you. Otherwise, I feel like I'm like, I was just wondering, can people hear me? Because I'm only hearing myself, so thank you for that. Um, Fook Pham is a, a photo editor at Wired, based in San Francisco. Hey, Fook. I hope you got in. Hi, everyone. Hey. Yeah. Good. And uh, David Hill is an author and freelance writer and the vice president of the National Writers Union, UAW Local 1981 in New York City. And also with us is Christina Bowie, a graduate of our program, a journalist turned campaign lead with the Media Guild of the West, based in Los Angeles. So thank you all for being here. Um, you know, we have about an hour. If you have a little extra time and we have more questions, I'd love for you to stay on just a few more minutes, but I wanna to try to be efficient. Um, one of the things that I'm really aware of, I've become increasingly aware of since I've, I've been part of unions is our time <laughs> and the fact that we often don't get paid for our work. So I said it would be an hour, I'm gonna to stick to an hour. Um, but I would love to, first start by hearing about how, how it is that you became interested, how it is that you started organizing or that you became um, involved in your union um, or in starting a union, uh, which I think is the case for a couple of you. So I wonder if we can go around the room, Carolina, Fook, and David and, and uh, Christina and talk about that, please. I think um, Christina should probably start first because she was earlier in on the ground floor of the LA Times uh, bargaining, uh, the excuse me, the unionizing effort. Right. What I will say uh, before throwing to her is that my, certainly my interest in unionizing um, emerged from having been in a union uh, when I worked at Time Magazine. We were uh, represented by communications workers and um, 
And then before that, I had been in a union at New York Newsday. And those were two jobs that I ended up taking buyouts from. And it was just so eye-opening to me, the difference between being laid off or taking a buyout from a unionized workshop shop and one that wasn't. When I landed at the LA Times and I read the employment contract and it was like, you're at will and we can pretty much get rid of you at any time and, um, and give you no more than two weeks pay. And oh, by the way, we can start cutting away at your benefits and you will have no say. Uh, over that. I mean, I think my previous employment experiences really set me up so that when I did learn about the unionization efforts that had been led by folks like Christina, I was like, okay, I'm on board. Like, no, no, no convincing needed here. No brainer. Yeah. You want to jump in, Christina? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for having me today. Uh, so I came to unions, you know, kind of the opposite direction of Carolina. <laughs> I graduated from the U of A, obviously got a great education there. Um, and the LA Times was my very first real job out of college. And so I knew nothing about unions, knew nothing about media unions in particular. Um, and, you know, I remember going into the job feeling really prepared and confident about like knowing how to do the work. And then I started working and realized that there were a lot of things I wasn't prepared for about the industry. Like it is full of people who say that you don't go into it for the money, you do journalism out of love, it's a public service, it's a greater good. And for years I kept thinking, you know, you have to pay your dues and work your way up and eventually things will get better. And then I realized that like things were not getting better for a lot of people. Um, like those two things can be true. You can love your job and you can want to pay your dues. But at the same time, this is an industry where those things are used as an excuse for like the genuine exploitation of workers and for disparities in the way that certain people are treated and paid. And seeing that inequity and the precariousness of everybody's jobs was really eye-opening in my first work experience. Um, so I got involved in organizing the LA Times mostly because of those two things. Um, I didn't know a lot about unionizing. Someone on the organizing committee at the Times kind of just approached me and said like, hey, do you wanna to come to a meeting? And so I came to a meeting and I remember thinking that the agenda was kind of uh, scattered. <laughs> so I suggested- You wanted to be efficient, <laughs> like a new throw meeting, yeah. Exactly. So I suggested <laughs> to the organizing committee member who'd invited me, um, I said, hey, you know, next time, I think it would be really helpful if you had like a list of talking points. And if you want us to invite other people to a meeting like this, like it would be really nice to just know what I should say to them. And she said, that sounds great. You should write that. And that is how I got involved in organizing. <laughs> um, and then, you know, after we won our union election, I served on the bargaining committee with Carolina and I got to see firsthand how unions literally change lives. Um, we had people on staff who got 25 or 50% raises because they had been so underpaid for so long because of our union contract. Um, and I think there's a lot more control that people have over their day-to-day -day work lives. Um, there's a mechanism for correcting wrongs that just did not exist before. And uh, seeing that change in the LA Times newsroom really made me want to see it happen all across the industry. So about a year ago now, um, I started working for the Guild full time. And since then, I've worked with organizing committees at the Desert Sun and the Southern California News Group. And I'm really excited about where we go next from here. Awesome. I'm going to ask if you I to talk. could I could I super go for it. jump in super yeah. quick. One of the things I wanted to piggyback on what Christina was saying is that it didn't just change working conditions for the staff. I think it just completely changed the attitude of how people operate you know if when we started organizing people were very wary and you know like how is this going to affect me and will I get in trouble and you know is it going to stir up too much trouble you now have a newsroom that I think operates in much more solidarity with each other like right hand knows what left hand is doing we're in much more constant communication but I think there is also this sense of when something that doesn't seem right 
happens, people aren't afraid to speak up. Whereas, you know, when we started unionizing, there were people that were like really afraid about speaking up about any issues in the newsroom. So the, the psychological shift along with the contract and all of these other things has just been, I'd, I'd say a complete 180. Yeah, I've definitely sensed that too. Um, well, I would love at some point for us to talk about like just undoing bad union propaganda over the years too, right? Which, which is what it's taken to get to this place, I think. Um, cool, Fook, you wanna jump in and talk about how you got started? Sure, and yeah, I. I guess I'm the baby organizer here, um, but I just wanted to echo what Carolina said about um, sort of people who have been empowered like in the short time. The Wired Union is super young. We're only, we got recognized in December after about a year and a half of sort of underground organizing. Um, but even in that short time, I've seen people who normally you know, would not have basically complained about things at work, just be very vocal about how uncomfortable they feel about certain policies and practices. Um, and it's been really cool to see people sort of become empowered to do so. Um, but my experience with sort of organizing in unions comes back to my time in college. I sort of covered unions a lot. I organized um, my student organization, like a progressive organization. Um, and then after college, I didn't know this at the time, but when I started working at The Nation in New York, I was an intern and um, you know, at that time we were being better paid, we were being paid better than the interns before. Um, and I didn't know this at the time, but it was directly a result of um, interns organizing. So they weren't formally part of the nation's union, um, but you know, they sort of um, organized on their own and you know, I reaped the benefits of that. So when it came to Wired, um, you know, Condé Nast is a very large place. It's you know, you know, the face of like luxury consumer capitalism and like sort of the journalism that goes along with it. So, you know, I sort of don't consider myself an essential worker. Like, I don't think I could hold that title like Rusen just said, um, but, you know, at first I was sort of taken uh, by it all. Like there's, you know, big budgets and things like that. But after a while, like you sort of see how um, a lot of the economics of the company don't really uh, benefit the people doing the work. Um, and you sort of start, you, I started seeing like a bunch of inequities and um, how I got involved with our union is, you know, I think what I think is sort of the cornerstone of organizing is just through personal relationships. Like a coworker pulled me aside, took me to a bar and was like, Fook, what do you like about Wired? And, you know, what are things you wish you could change? And, you know, that's sort of how, like, the cornerstone of still like our organizing and like our bargaining today. Um, so I think, you know, just my start in, in organizing is like what I'd like to leave behind once we win a contract and like once I hopefully leave Wired, um, you know, like just those emotional, like those personal relationships and that solidarity is like, you know, like what brought me in and like what I really believe in in sort of how unions are the, the sort of strength of unions, basically. Does that mean you don't you don't get to complain as much? Because that's like a right you you want to keep <laughs> as a journalist, yeah, totally. right? <laughs> Good. Um, cool, David. You want to chime in? Sure. I, I think I had a um, I came at this completely the opposite way. I was a union organizer who became a, a writer and a media worker. I um, in the late nineties, I um, I left school to become a, a an organizer in the South. Um, and I organized uh, service workers and light manufacturing workers throughout the South. And I did that through the early 2000s into maybe, you know, the early, I don't know what we call it, the odds or the teens or whatever, but I, I ended up becoming a, um, uh, I started writing around 2010 and I became, I left organizing to write and freelance full time uh, around 2015. Um, and so I, have a, I had a kind of a career as a union organizer and um, doing that work before I became a writer and, and sort of changed gears a little bit. But I think originally I might have gone looking for a union in that world to assuage some of the guilt I felt about leaving a profession that the world needs more of to join one that maybe they were putting up already. But I, um, I also found when I became a freelancer that the standards 
that existed were really difficult to make a living with. And, um, and so I found the National Writers Union who at that time were, um, the National Writers Union has this kind of long, you know, proud history. They were started in 1981 by a, a group of kind of amazing writers like Tony Morrison who um, formed the union in order to deal with a lot of the issues we talk about today, they were dealing with in the late seventies and early eighties. And they formed the National Writers Union and they won a lot of really amazing battles throughout the eighties and nineties. And they grew the union to thousands and thousands of members took the New York Times to the Supreme Court and won, had these, you know, had a really powerful organization and it was completely made up of freelance, freelance writers. Um, and they were really able to make a big impact in the standards that writers had. But by the time I found the National Writers Union, not only were the standards for freelance writers much, much worse, you know, really kind of as low as they could go, but also the union was a shell of what it once had been. A lot of the members of that union were older. A lot of them weren't working as writers anymore. They had retired. Very few had worked in in digital media at all. And I think the union was kind of like, had kind of lost touch with what had happened to the world of media post the internet age, which was kind of ironic because I think the union was needed more than ever in a period of time when there were more people, there were more opportunities to write, to be a freelance media worker than there ever had been before, but the standards were also incredibly low. And so I got involved in the National Writers Union and now I'm a part of a project to really rebuild that organization and to make it kind of more relevant to, um, the sort of current world of media freelancers, but also to kind of ride in the wake of this um, incredible wave of organizing that's happening among staff writers at publications all across the country. And so, you know, I think that the role that freelancers will play in that wave is crucial. And it's one that I think we can't forget about or, you know, leave it behind. And so the, I think um, the National Writers Union is an organization that hopefully can help, you know, make sure that that sort of um, leg of the stool or whatever is uh, to mix metaphors is represented though. Um, so I'm involved in that project today. And, um, you know, I try to, I, I'm also a full-time freelance writer, but, um, you know, I, I try to bring whatever lessons I learned during my days as a, um, a traveling um, agitator to, uh, to help other freelance writers in this project. So that's how I got here. So cool. So, I mean, speaking of being a, a traveling agitator, I mean, inherently, I would say that so many journalists, storytellers, freelancers, you know, photographers are like inherently that, right? Um, why, why do you think this moment is so ripe? I mean, you mentioned some of those reasons, David, but if we could go back, go back to Christina and Carolina and, and keep following this pattern, what do you think is really kind of uh, triggering um, this huge, what I think is a huge wave in, in unionization right now? Um, again, I think probably Christina's the answer to this. I mean, you know, I think, I think certainly, I know, because she's such an expert. I always <laughs> just defer to her because she knows everything. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I think certainly in our own case, um, a lot of it is the increasing tenuous position of media in general. You know, things are really shaky. Newspapers are shutting down. Websites are shutting down. And um, well, but in the case of the LA Times, you had an especially bad management, right? Tone yeah. Death management. And I think the unionization effort started off as, you know, dealing with management sort of, um, cutting us, repeatedly cutting us to the bone. You know, it was, it was this game of attrition that they were playing to make money. So every year they would lay off journalists and, you know, sort of cut deeper into the bone. But in the meantime, I, I think part of what also led to our unionization was this deep sense of inequity that Christina had addressed earlier at, you know, what these executives were getting paid to trim our newsroom by 10 or 15% every year. You know, we had uh, a chief executive who was taking home a $15 million bonus for essentially like cutting the paper, you know, for consulting, uh, paying himself like millions and millions of dollars. You know, we had uh, a publisher who flew around on a private jet that was like billed to the company. You know, the, 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 the fact in our case was that the money was there it wasn't a ton of money but the money was there it just wasn't being spent on us it was being spent on this like incredible range of executive perks and that certainly gets at some of the wider conversations we're having about inequity economic inequity in our society at this point you know as, as christina mentioned these these journalists who hadn't seen raises in forever a lot of people with really deflated wages wages that had not kept up with los angeles inflation you know raises people who hadn't gotten raises in over a decade and I think there was this real sense of like, 
you know, a shakiness in the industry combined with this sense that when there is money at play, it's not going to the workers. It's going to the executives who are paying themselves handsomely for doing whatever it is they do. <laughs> right. Everything Carolina said, and I would also add uh, winning begets winning. The, the wave that we're seeing across the industry is partially because we just keep seeing organizing win after organizing win. And you know the News Guild, I think, organized something like 47 newsrooms uh, last year, and we won every single one of those elections. And uh, I think when journalists, you know, journalists talk to other journalists all the time, this is an industry of like very well connected people. And uh, people in other newsrooms talk about how successful their organizing drive has been, how much it's changed the culture of the newsroom. And people want to make that happen in their own workplaces. Yeah, absolutely. And folks, since you are the, the baby in this group, as you said, what are your insights about joining the unionization wave at this point? Maybe perhaps I'm curious what, what, what took so long for Wire to get here? Had there been talks about unionization for a long time? Yeah, I think one of the challenges of a place like Wired is that um, there had been talks, there had been whispers, like, you know, even in my own team, um, which no one, I'm the only organizer from my team, but we were like, oh, maybe we should form a union, just jokingly, like, you know, as a response to how awful things were. Um, but lo and behold, there was a unionization effort that was invisible to me uh, at the time. And it had been going on for about a year. Um, I think joining, so we're sort of in sort of the third or like second and a half wave of organizing at Condé Nast. Uh, the New Yorker is sort of at the vanguard uh, followed by Pitchfork and Ars Technica. Um, but to give you a sense, like New, the New Yorker has been at the table, they're in their third year of bargaining, right? This is their third year at the table after a year of getting right after taking a year to get recognized, things just move extremely slowly at Condé Nast. It's it's like a cruise liner. There's it's extremely hard to steer. I mean, slow to steer. Um, and you know, even just for us to get recognized took five months, which was like the longest in the News Guild, um, at least the News Guild of New York. Um, so there was that. So that was like half of the org organize half of the time it took us for, to organize. We took about a year. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of it was just sort of, it's hard work sort of gathering your coworkers, um, especially in a place, working conditions force people to leave, like they leave to find better jobs, especially at a place like Wired where we're competing with not only other publications, but uh, we're competing with tech companies and venture capital firms for talent because um, they pay their employees so much better. Um, so there's a lot of turnover um, there's been turnover in our organizing committee um, and, you know, people leave. So there's a lot of small sort of obstacles in the way, I would say. Um, but you know, well, on the flip side of that, like following the New Yorker and like Ars Technica and Pitchfork, um, like we, ha we inherit a lot of the benefits of their organizing and their bargaining. Like we come to the table with a lot of tentative agreements um, already locked in place with Condé and you know we are free to make our own modifications but it does sort of free us up to sort of help other shops who are in their stages of organizing um, and sort of galvanize our members around topics and issues that are very specific to Wired. So it's a give and take. I think you know it took us a while but we are sort of inheriting um, a lot of the benefits of sort of our patients I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And ironically, being part of such a large media company, it's interesting. Um, David, so as someone who has organized other workers too, can you shed some light into like why uh, we're having this risk? Well, actually, I wouldn't call it a resurgence of, of unionization. This is, this is the first wave for, for, um, for journalists, right? It's just we are... Uh, seeing a resurgence of unionization across all industries, but I'm curious what what kind of lessons you learn from organizing other other workers that um, are 
are evident now, are useful now to journalists and writers? Well, I don't know, you know, I don't know that there's any one reason clearly that, that we could point to and say, this is the reason this is happening now. But I, I do think that like a lot of the reasons that have already been mentioned are, are definitely part of it. And one of the things that Bob just mentioned about turnover, I think is key, right? I, um, traditionally having a lot of turnover in your industry would make it difficult to organize because you never have a group, sort of a solid group of folks together that you can um, organize with because people keep leaving. And, you know, like my father had a terrible job, but he never left it, right? He left it, he, he worked that terrible job his entire life. And people in our generation change jobs a lot. In fact, I think today, um, people often see leaving a job as a solution to a bad job, right? That if a job is bad, then you would just leave and go get a better one somewhere else. Well, within media, because it's sort of not that large of a pool, folks could only do that so many times before they realize like, oh, all these jobs are bad. So like leaving this job and going to another one is not the solution, right? The solution is we have to figure out how to fix this industry. And I think that realization, people coming to that realization over time because they had worked at enough jobs within their own industry and encountered the same problems again and again and didn't realize, oh, it's not just that I had a bad boss or bad management at this company, but that the, there's something sort of, there's something wrong with the whole industry that, that, that only we're gonna be able to fix if we, by building power for ourselves. I think that had a big part of what, you know, played a big role in, in, in creating this, this wave. That and also what, what folks had said before about, you know, success, burning success. I think it was in the beginning of this and I don't know where you want to tech the beginning, but like, when, you know, I helped out on the Gawker campaign and there was a lot of fear during that campaign, right? And um, people were very nervous about it, but, you know, but it's success, I think motivated people advice and other places. And, and with each successive success, there was a growing sense of sort of strength and power and courage that I think led to the next campaign. And I think that's how the wave kind of builds. Right, Gawker was very much at the beginning of all this and received a lot of bad publicity. So can, can you talk about, about what the sacrifices of, of being part of, of starting a union at your workplace or, or organizing if you've, if you've been working independently, what at, that has come at what price? I'm really curious as to like, what sort of time commitment we're talking about and you know, um, what have been some of the challenges along the way? Christina, let's start with you since you're the expert. <laughs> oh man, uh, that's a tough <laughs> one. I, I mean, I guess I left an entire job in journalism, right? <laughs> I really loved copy editing at the LA Times, but being an organizer and being able to work with so many people across the industry has been really meaningful. Um, there, I think there is more of a sacrifice than we probably talk about initially. There, it, it takes a lot of time. Carolina can tell you that like we spent, I don't know, it felt like a whole second full-time job to be on the organizing committee and the bargaining committee at the LA Times. because Right, we and it happens at night, right? After your working day. For me, it happened pretty much all day long because I was working a night shift as a copy editor. And so I would get up in the morning and do my organizing work first. And then I would go to, to my job and keep working until probably 11 o'clock at night. And I do it all again the next day. Um, but I mean, I guess I didn't really see it as a sacrifice at the time because I felt like I was gaining so much in solidarity. Yeah. Yeah. And Carolina? I think, you know, I think with any union organizing campaign and then later with bargaining, uh, with establishing a union, you, know, you can choose to be involved as much as you want to or not. I mean, we have folks that helped unionize their department and then that was their contribution. And then there are other folks who like Christina and I went you know, served on the main uh, uh, organizing committee and then went to serve on the bargaining committee. I'd say the bargaining committee was probably the bigger commitment having to bargain a brand new uh, contract from scratch. Um, I was also serving as co-chair and, um, you know, it is a second full-time job and um, it is exhausting. And I won't lie that I devised all kinds of ways of trying to stay awake <laughs> while, while, while doing my job, including I've learned 15 minute naps on the floor because then you don't fall fully asleep, <laughs> work, work really well. Because well, I think, you know, I, I think, you know, beyond just 
organizing with the company, I think something like bargaining a contract, what you're doing is you're continuously organizing. So you're organizing behind the issues in your contract. You're getting the, the unit behind you. In our case, it's a big and unwieldy unit of you know several, it was like 400 people when we began uh, bargaining the contract. Now it's close to 500. Um, that is a lot of work. And then I also think just us as a committee, we were an eight member bargaining committee and making sure that we were marching in formation when we walked into that room with the lawyers and making sure we were on the same page and that we had debated things out and that we were, you know, generally um, a united front against the company. It was all a lot of work, but I, you know, like Christina said, it's like, I, I regret nothing. <laughs> like, I think the, the, the security that it has brought to the newsroom, the changes um, and the, and even, you know, I think how would we have faced the pandemic and then the uprisings without a union? It would have been a whole lot messier. Um, we would have, without a doubt, probably lost staff. They probably would have cut 20% of the staff right then and there. I have no doubts. Oh, yeah. And then and then the other thing is that the, the union gave us a mechanism to deal with the questions of racial inequity that, that had been part of the organizing drive. You know, we had an article in our contract that required, um, you know, it was the Rooney rule. It was something that Christi actually, I think Christina brought to the table was uh, that the company needed to interview two diverse candidates for every position as a requirement of the contract that, you know, they couldn't just give nice speeches about loving diversity. They had to begin to put it into action. So, you know, we had done a pay equity study early on. So I felt like the union gave us this structure to contend with this very challenging period, both like economically, health-wise, and, um, you know, in terms of seeking things like racial and gender equity within, within our newsroom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I regret nothing. Those 15 minute naps, <laughs> do what you have to do. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. No, I feel the same way about my own experience in unions. And, and Fuchs, since you're very much the early stages of this, how have you been able to balance your, your work at Wired with, with these, this new duty, this new drive? Yeah, um, I'm like Kelly and I'm also like our vice chair. So there's a lot of meetings and uh, one of the detriments of being on the West Coast is that all the meetings are right. even like during my work hours and sometimes like early in the morning or sometimes, yeah. So, oh, yeah. you know, late nights and all of that aside, like that's the small stuff, right? Um, but some of the challenges we faced are like, um, especially as organizers, is just like checking our egos at the door. Um, I feel like a lot of us on the unit um, council can be very sort of, um, dug in on our politics. Um, and sometimes that's not where the membership is, right? Sometimes you sort of have to um, sort of tone it down or like, you know, walk them through the steps of like, why this is important and why this, you know, you may not feel like your job is in danger, but like, here are the reasons, here are the many ways it could be better, right? And uh, here are, you know, your colleagues who may not have it as good as you. So the walking them through some of that is, sometimes very humbling um, and you know I think we weren't able to get status quo um, what that means is sort of basic protections against um, you know any changes in the workplace so for example we suffered layoffs right in the middle of our sort of recognition campaign um, so we weren't able to ask the company to we weren't able to bargain over the effects of those layoffs because we weren't recognized as a union yet. But something we were able to do is because we were sort of in organizing mode and sort of in the mindset that we're a cohesive unit who looks out for each other, like we were able to, um, you know, at multiple times set up mutual aid funds and sort of uh, provide sort of monetary like help for the people who were laid off. Um, so that was helpful, I guess. Um, and yeah, those are the sort of biggest challenges so far, sort of contending with everyone's emotions about the union. Like some people support it um, in theory, but sort of have hangups that you sort of have to walk through. 
Um, and sometimes people have close relations with management um, that you sort of have to manage. Um, so there's a lot of emotional like, labor that goes into it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, what you speak to really reminded me of uh, um, our experience organizing at KPCC Public Radio in LA where I felt like what we were doing was as much trying to change the culture of this place as it was trying to get people to, to work for a collective good. You know, there was this, this sense that like, I got a good contract, I got a good deal, I'm out of here in the next six months, a year. So, you know, um, why should I, why should I put work and this emotional labor as you speak to it, Fook, uh, towards something that I'm not gonna benefit from, right? Um, and that, that takes longer, that takes longer, I, I, I suspect even than the unionization effort. And David, for you, having come from unionizing as well, and then being a writer, a freelancer in particular, how, what have been some of those, those challenges for you? I think for me in particular, the thing that comes to mind is that, you know, as freelancers, uh, we, we eat what we kill, you know, like we're constantly going hat in hand to publications, asking them to um, accept our pitches and to publish us. And so one of the things that we do in our union is um, we handle grievances for members. And the thing about that is that it's just other members like myself that are handling it, that have been trained to do it, but we're all freelancers. And so often, you know, there'll be a grievance at a publication and we'll pass it around like a hot potato. Like who wants, who wants to handle this one? And it ultimately will land on someone who has no intention of ever pitching that publication will be the one that's willing to get into a fight with them on behalf of one of our members, because you don't want to sort of spoil you don't own. want to alienate your future client. Wow. Right. So, so that's, you know, that's, that's definitely a, a challenging kind of thing to navigate as a freelancer is trying to organize in this like broad sea of places that we all work for. Um, but I think just like everybody else said, I mean, it's definitely a time commitment. The work that we do, none of us are paid for it. We're all members. We all pay dues to this union and we all also contribute a lot of our time to the union. This is our union is small. We don't have any paid staff or anything like that. And, um, and we're trying to sort of take on this monumental task kind of all on our own in our own time. And uh, there are a lot of weeks where I spend more time, you know, doing this type of work than I do doing my paid labor that, you know, as a writer. Um, so uh, that's definitely a sacrifice that I think a lot of us are making. But one thing that I'm realizing is as we grow and as we're getting bigger, that workload becomes less because we are able to develop more leadership and spread that work out among more of us. So as we grow and get stronger, it will also mean that less of us, fewer of us have to take on such a burden and, um, and the work will be, you know, it'll, it'll have a much different feel to it um, going forward, so. David, were you part of that effort to, uh, to have The Intercept develop those guidelines for freelancers? Yes, I was, that was, that was us, yes. Yeah, could you talk a little bit about that? Because I thought that was a really unique way to, to use uh, just organizers, I mean, it's rather freelancers influence to affect a specific publication that relies on freelancers a lot. Sure, so just sort of to give you the, the, the full history of this. I mean, when I first got elected to the board at the National Writers Union, one of the things that I sort of set out to do was to figure out how, you know, I wanted to answer a lot of these questions about what happened to the National Writers Union, right? Like why, what, I, I discovered kind of a lot of agreements um, with publications similar to what we have, what, what you're referring to at The Intercept, that, that the NWU used to have with publications all over the country, you know, all weeklies in most of the major cities, you know, big magazines, um, even publishing companies that had agreements with the National Writers Unions that covered um, standards and conditions for freelancers that they, that they hired, including rates and rate schedules and, and things like that. All these agreements had expired and were kind of gone, and 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 I was kind of coming up as a freelancer in a world where people were told like you can't do this kind of thing, right? That um, so we kind of dusted those agreements off and wanted I wanted to figure out how we could um, uh, do something similar to that again. So I started contacting publications that used to have agreements with the National Writers Union that still existed, places like The Nation, you know, a lot of like kind of le more left wing places that I where I had contacts there or I knew people in management that I could reach out to or where I knew people that were freelancing from there that I could build a little committee at. And we were trying to sort of pilot this idea that we could have these types of agreements at publications again today. And, um, and so eventually that project led into uh, us doing this, this, this agreement at The Intercept where we um, met over the course of many months, we had a committee that met with The Intercept to 
negotiate um, over standards, right? Standards of how freelancers, how they would deal with their freelancers at that publication. And, you know, that agreement was not at all meant to be kind of a standalone thing. I mean, we're hoping to do similar ones um, as many places as we can. Um, and we already have a few at some other places, but, you know, what we're piloting here is a project that we think could be applicable anywhere um, in media. And um, specifically, you know, we, we're hoping that publications will kind of make public their commitment to certain standards around not just, you know, um, how they'll um, uh, accept and deal with the work that these folks are doing, but also when people will be paid, how they'll be paid, um, you know, how people's problems will be hand, saw, uh, dealt with if they have issues or questions. Um, all these kinds of things go into the um, discussions that we're having with publications. So in a way it's like, you know, it mirrors what the process of collective bargaining in some ways, but it's also a little bit different, right? Um, and we're just, we're doing it that way because as freelancers, we're trying to figure out what space we can live in as organized freelancers trying to raise standards where we don't have the ability to collectively bargain with the employer because we don't have kind of a legal bargaining unit, um, but we still want to use whatever little bit of power we have to, um, to raise standards in any way that we can. And so, Figuring out what that space is, figuring out what that line is that we have to walk is a work, very much a work in progress. But the intercept was a big, a big victory for us, and we're hoping that we can build on it. Yeah, well, I definitely, you know, in in my connections in the magazine world or in, or relationships rather, um, I should say that a lot of people are talking about it, and it's definitely a model, and that's it's really awesome that you started there. Um, but um, you know, I. I feel like there's also, you know, right now we have the great benefit of having social media and, and public shaming, right? I mean, I think it was a couple of years ago that outside got a lot of hate uh, over social media for owing, owning, um, owing thousands and thousands of dollars to freelancers. And, and they eventually, I think, were brought to court and had to pay up. So, yeah, I think there's just a lot more tools to our disposal these days. Um, cool. Well, I want to welcome questions um, in case folks have uh, questions for, for our guests here today. Um, feel free to, to unmute yourself and just speak up. I see Karen has a question. I can sort of field, I think, the second and maybe the first part of this question. Okay, go for it. Um, so our newsroom, there is, you know, a very clear distinction between the workers who are, you know, come from historically the print side um, and work exclusively on the magazine and those um, who work on the digital side. Um, and in terms of demographics, you know, like uh, the people who work on print skew um, older and wider, uh, and then the people on digital skew younger and also um, more diverse. So there's, there's that type of difference, but there's also differences in, um, you know, material working conditions, right? Print people are generally paid more. Um, so, you know, gratefully, like we are very grateful for our comrades in print because they're very, a lot of them are very down for the cause. Um, but there can be sort of friction there because their working conditions are much more stable and sort of aren't subject to the rigors of the economy of like online publishing, right? Um, so there are like material differences there. So the, they, and they manifest in sort of differences in politics as well. And sometimes that you sort of have to address those differently. Um, and there's also organizing differences, right? Say like, so we ran into this when we were organizing um, what's called um, a work to rule. So that's when you work just, um, you know, the hours that you're paid for. So eight hours, a lot of the, we were, we were hoping to do it during a print close week and that proved difficult a difficult sell because a lot of the print people are sort of committed to working like 10, 12 hour days on print close weeks. Um, and they really mm -hmm. felt- The magazine ready for, for the printer. Yeah, mm -hmm. to ship it, yeah, basically. Okay. Um, you know, there's a lot of like copy work, a lot of design work, um, a lot of fact checking work that goes on. Um, and a lot of print people were sort of hesitant to sort of you know, they didn't want to feel like they were the ones holding up the process. Um, so it took a lot of like, it was a bit of a hard sell. Um, I think it took a lot of finagling in this sort of, okay, maybe you get off Slack and then keep working it, but don't respond to emails type of thing. So it was 
sometimes you have to make compromises um, because of those differences. But yeah, there, there's there's definitely a lot to sort of navigate in the print and digital divide. Um, and I want to maybe I'll take a step back on the first question, but I also have thoughts on that. Well, go for it, Fook. You got the you got the floor. Yeah, I just think that like. Um, it's a false dichotomy, sort of like there are material differences between the work that we do as journalists and, you know, the work that someone in the factory does, right, or someone who's organizing at Amazon does, right. Um, but, you know, there's also lots of room for solidarity, solidarity, like I don't think we should be supporting each other and sort of supporting other unions efforts, right, we should definitely recognize, we shouldn't be blind to those differences, right, like we get to sort of work from home while other people have to go into like factory floors and things like that. Um, but I think it's more useful and more productive to sort of think of each, think of everyone in a union as part of like a, a sort of collective movement across the country and across the world. Like um, not only for like emotional and solidarity purposes, but also to, it's an easy way to sort of connect um, sort of the things we do in the sort of political economy to the sort of labor that other people do, right? Um, we're all laboring under the same forces, like the same private equity firm that owns a local newspaper could very well be the same one that owns, you know, some manufacturing plant. So even though the work we do looks different, like we're still sort of all laboring under the same conditions more, I mean, broadly. Right, capitalism is capitalism is capitalism. Um, I think Seth had a question and then David. Okay, hi, hi everybody, thanks for coming on. Uh, my question is just kind of how the, your job as journalists and as part of the unions uh, has made it harder under the last administration's attack on, attacks on journalists and you know, freedom of the press and you know, that kind of thing. So just kind of curious about that and your th guys' thoughts on it. And how that relates to unions, I guess I just want to- Just how, how it's affected you or, or your union, just kind of curious how you have had to deal with it or you know, anybody. I mean, I think doubly attacked, right? Journalists and yeah. and union <laughs> union exactly. members. Yeah, yeah, no. And there was always this challenge of knowing, like, okay, if we take uh, a case to the National Labor Relations Board, we're going to be facing Trump's Labor Relations Board, and what would that mean for any sort of ruling? And will they be sympathetic to unions? You know, it's like full of his uh, cronies. I think you know it has certainly come up, you know, in a very material way. Uh, in terms of one of the things that the union is concerned about is the safety of its journalists. So, um, you know, we have one of the things we bargain for is clauses in our contract that if you don't feel safe covering a story, you can um, withdraw from covering that story without penalty, you know, without, without that being held against you uh, professionally that the company will provide the appropriate gear. Like, I can't tell you how much time we spent at the bargaining table talking about material for reporters who go cover fires. And then before this national election, you know, I kind of couldn't believe it, but then I could believe it was, you know, having this whole conversation of making sure that journalists, you know, in certain locations in the country, like, do they need black jackets, like, you know, to cover a US election? So taking care of these very material needs of like basic safety. Um, you know, we had two of our reporters attacked by police um, during the uprisings in Minneapolis. So dealing with those kinds of questions has been an important union issue during this time. And I would say that's, that's probably one of the points in, in which they coalesce in a very obvious way. I would add too, I think there was a big mindset shift in the same way that like everybody in the last four years realized that democracy is actually very fragile and you need to work to preserve it. Um, I think there was kind of an eye-opening experience in that people realized that U.S. labor law is not designed to protect people who labor and that real power doesn't come from the law or whichever administration is in place. It comes from solidarity and people standing together and taking action together. Yeah. I'll just want to add that, you know, our union is on the, we, we're the American affiliate to the International Federation of Journalists, which is a, uh, an international body of journalists, journalism unions around the world. And we do a lot of work with the IFJ at the UN and stuff. And, you know, prior to 2016, a lot of our work with the IFJ was figuring out how we as 
as the American members of the IFJ could come to the aid of journalists who were, you know, um, journalists around the world for whatever sort of they were dealing with with their own governments or in their own um, context. And after the Trump, the Trump administration was the first time I'd ever seen other journalists from other countries coming to us and asking what they could do to help us. How could they support journalists in the United States? What, you know, how could they show us some solidarity? You know, the, the tables had completely, the dynamic had completely shifted to where our affiliate was suddenly the one that was seen by our, by other members affiliates around the world as the one that was in trouble and in need of real um, solidarity and, and help. Yeah. This is such a great question. Um, mostly because everyone wants to seem to answer it. Uh, yeah, just to echo what uh, Carolina said again, um, a lot of, one of the issues at our table right now is like, and I think that's going to be more pertinent for people going into the industry now is that how do we take care of our journalists, our colleagues who are going to be doxxed, right? I think, especially under the last administration, a lot of the cultural forces that Trump ginned up were the ones who, you know, were liable to dox you, right? And what we're trying to build into the contract is language that would ask the company to pay for digital sort of services that would basically erase you from the internet, right? Um, you know, of course they're very reluctant to, but you know, we believe that it's part of like building in humanity into the contracts. Like we need to sort of protect um, our colleagues from doing that. Um, and almost, going back to the- Sorry to interrupt, but are you talking about preventative, like almost like ahead of a big expose or something? How would that work? Um, I think it depends on case by case, right? Um, uh -huh. and that's sort of the language that the company always wants to use to sort of defer it out of the contract. But I think in mm -hmm. practice, what it would look like is if, you know, I was a if I was reporting out a big feature and I would afraid I would get like swatted or doxxed, I would ask the company like, hey, can you pay for this service to scrub the internet of like any sort of personal information that's out there? Um, or, you know, sometimes it's reactive and sometimes you're facing harassment from an online mob and you want, um, you know, reactive protection. So it's, it goes both ways. Um, and yeah, just to echo the stuff about the National Labor Relations Board, like we were, you know, Conde like dragged their feet recognizing us for like five months. So a lot of our meetings were like, well, should we take this to the NLRB? Should we put this to a vote? And our our organizers were basically like, well, we don't really want to do that because we're facing a Trump board. And it's like, I think I think that's put puts us in a harder place. So um, I mean, Biden has said he's pro-union, but we will see. Cool. Shall we go to David? You had a question. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you. Um, we at uh, Future, which is a British company, but holds a bunch of US tech brands, tech reporting brands, just finished our first, uh, bargaining our first contract successfully. Um, but I wanted to jump on what um, what David was talking about with the, uh, uh, the Intercept's sort of bill of, or series of freelancer protection rights. Um, obviously would love to get this to every site, but it seems like an entirely voluntary process for each company to be pressured and nudged and really adopt these things that it will say it will, you know, fulfill and commit to. So what's the, what's moving forward to, you know, we're having a hard enough time getting these union um, rights and privileges for staff workers, but what about freelancers and how do we get them there? Well, I think for an individual first, for any particular publication, you know, I think we, we've been sort of, um, we just sort of answer the call, right? Like people have reached out to us and said, we'd like to do this here, we'd like to do that there. And then some of us will go and start working with that group. I mean, when I finish with this, I'm getting on another Zoom immediately after this with a group at another um, large magazine that we're trying to do the same type of agreement at. So it's really been kind of like ad hoc at this point. I think our vision for this is that we'll be able to grow our capacity to do this in a much more um, strategic and kind of um, uh, um, pointed way, right? Where we can pick targets instead of letting people, instead of answering the call, we can kind of choose the, the strategic places that we think will help shape where the industry is going. But we're just not there yet in terms of um, strength and leverage. Um, so right now we're just sort of, you know, we like I said, we just answer the call. So if you know a publication or you work at one where you think you'd like to see something like this, um, I'll drop my email in the chat and hopefully we can work with folks there to, uh, to start a process. Awesome. Cool. Um, 
Sarah, did you want to ask your question? Sure. Um, what are the biggest challenges unions are facing in 2021 and beyond? You mean media unions or journalist yes. unions in particular? Yes. Hmm. Anyone want to take that on? That's a big question. I mean, I would say off the top, and, and this is something that we, you know, discuss all the, all the time within the context of the Media Guild of the West, which is our new local, is the stability of the industry in general. Like if there is no industry, it's much harder to have unions. The people in unions at the LA Times are full-time uh, workers. If for some reason the paper were to switch over to some other content model or were to, you know, uh, disappear entirely, you know, it would disappear something, it would, it would disappear the union. And so I think the health of our industry is very much like, you know, a challenge, a challenge and, and probably Christina working with all of these other units, we have a lot of uh, papers in California that are owned by Alden Media, which is that, you know, venture capital, aka vulture capital fund that like basically buys community newspapers and strips them for parts, you know, and like uh, sends them to a chop shop. And, um, you know, I see that as the, as the biggest challenge. Yeah, I was going to say consolidation. Uh, Gannett is the biggest newspaper chain in the country. Um, we have Alden Global Capital trying to buy Tribune Publishing, which, and Alden obviously owns Digital First Media, aka Media News Group. Um, we have all of these giant chains, and you know we can organize one newsroom at a time, but we're still facing a chain when we're in bargaining, and so we really need to organize every newsroom and every chain in order to really win. Um, something I'm seeing at Condé Nast, and I think I'm, a, I'm afraid it will happen at other large um, media companies that mm. are sort of resistant to being bought up by venture, uh, sort of by uh, private equity, is that consolidation happens in another way where um, consolidation and outsourcing. Um, so a lot of our, so Condé Nast is known for like very wildly popular uh, video series on YouTube, um, on YouTube like Bon Appetit and Wired and like Vogue and all of them. But a lot of our video department was laid off and sort of, um, you know, they're, they're their own hub in the company. And there's like hubs for like copy and research, hubs for like photo editors, hubs for like other people. So each one of those hubs, um, they can't organize with their, um, the shop they're working with. Like you, if I was a copy editor I couldn't organize with GQ just because like I'm employed by this hub so companies are figuring out um, ways to sort of chop up their workforce um, and sort of slice it up to sort of um, divide and conquer basically and that a lot of that is going on um, and a lot of companies are taking their production uh, and outsourcing it to um, you know third-party vendors like a lot of our podcast team um, was laid off uh, I think right before the holiday, um, the winter holiday. And that was tragic because they were developed, a lot of them were developing really well received um, podcast series. And then all of a sudden they're just being outsourced to like this other company. So uh, we don't, we don't, a lot of the major companies that, um, you know, like Kanye Nest aren't subject to the forces of being bought up by other companies, but they're definitely sort of downsizing and consolidating and sort of making it harder to unionize. So forgive me for a dumb question, but can any of you clarify how that might work if you're a big media company and you subcontract out some of your editorial services, uh, whether or not your, um, you know, the, the content making, the content makers are organized that does not trickle down in any way to, to other people that are subcontracted out by that company. It does not establish some sort of like norm for anyone they work with? The, the only thing we could do, for example, in our contract, like we can't regulate what the company say pays freelancers because our union is not made up of freelancers. We tried, <laughs> it's like the company was like, no, you have no authority in that area. Um, one of the things we were able to do is as a condition of the company being allowed to hire contractors is to make sure that they are paid the minimum 
of in our in that wage bracket. So if we bring in, say, a designer for like a three month project that they're not paid under the rate that an LA Times designer would be paid as a way of boosting contractor salaries, but also as a way of protecting our own unit so that the company can't then be hiring contractors and employing them as cheap labor. And then there is language in the contract that, you know, while certainly, you know, we don't want to get in the way of the company experimenting and trying new things that could potentially bring in revenue at the same time, we don't want that to undercut the union. And so there is language in there about um, it not that these contractors not taking jobs from existing staff. Oh. So there's a little bit of architecture we have in there to support the work that contractors do and the benefits that they get and the kind of pay that they get. But it's, you know, we're very limited in what we can do in that area because we literally don't have um, not controlling the books. Yeah, yeah and we don't and we don't have a we don't have legal authority over over some of those positions. Mm -hmm. So the company's exactly. like, I mean, we tried to get our foreign correspondents in the union and they were like, nope, because foreign correspondents are governed by the labor laws of their respective oh, countries. That's interesting. Like you can't apply US law to a correspondent in Mexico. And um, I mean, they could have if they'd wanted to had the parts of the contract, like say governing benefits or other things they could have accepted that, but they they didn't. Um, and it's it's my understanding is, is that it's fairly typical. Um, Christina, please correct me if I'm wrong. It's very interesting. This, this, I, this question about freelancers and hubs and, and within media and how this work is being kind of, um, I mean, the whole idea behind a freelancer once upon a time was that a publication should be able to hire a writer for kind of a one-off piece that only that writer could write. And so well, I don't want to, have to employ this person to have the write this, but today we live in a, in a world where there, we, we call it permalance, right? Where people are freelance forever. They're just temp workers who are being, you know, exploited. And, and this, this question is, extends beyond media. This is kind of the biggest problem that I think the labor movement is going to have to face going forward is how the American economy is redefining the relationship between employers and employees in every industry. I mean, this is the biggest threat to the Teamsters contract at UPS is that FedEx drivers are, are independent contractors. They're all business or Amazon's drivers. They're all individual businesses. You know, the biggest, the biggest threat that exists to, you know, um, to a lot of labor unions in this country right now is the fact that those standards that they've won and built are going to be undermined by companies figuring out how to change the relationship with their employees, turn the employees into individual independent contractors, turn the employees into you know these ind independent businesses that they then can um, offload a lot of their liabilities, their responsibilities, and dilute those workers' power. I think that this is the big challenge of the labor movement going into the future is how to fight that that battle. Right, and this is radically different from the union fights from, I don't know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Um, Mary Lou, you had a question, sorry for the long wait. You're muted, we can't hear you. you I'm really glad to see that that um, the union movement is, is progressing because I'm a union person. And I'm, uh, I've been researching Metro Daily newspapers for the last seven years uh, for my book that came out last year. And I found that unions are really important in ensuring journalistic autonomy. And I think that's a tremendous uh, 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 benefit of unions. And I, but I also have found that um, owners uh, are bringing in union busting law firms who will delay negotiations. They, in, during COVID, now they're not showing up. They're saying you have to show up in person. Um, they're, they're you know, just totally trying to undercut the credibility of the unions. And I'd like to know what um, your panel feels are the strategies that, that uh, media outlets can, can uh, employ to, to fight this. We have a lawyer at our table who speaks very slowly um, and the running sort of complaint about him is that this is a deliberate tactic on behalf of the company um, to drag out meetings and to sort of sap everyone's morale. 
Um, thankfully, we have really good uh, staff organizers who sort of pester them all day long with emails and sort of are very aggressive in asking them for bargaining dates. But um, I would, one of the strategies that we like to employ is to encourage not only members of our unit, but of uh, units across the company who are in solidarity with us to attend our bargaining sessions, right? Because um, that's within everyone's legal rights. Like, no, don't have to be part of either bargaining committee, either management or the union to, to come and observe a meeting. Um, and sometimes we even ask them to give testimonial on the um, topic that's being bargained. Um, and that sort of places pressure on um, the union, right? Uh, uh, I mean, sorry, the company uh, to sort of respond um, in good faith, not only in good faith, but in, in sort of in a, in a manner that's sort of respectful of everyone's time and effort. Mm -hmm. Public shaming works too. I mean, that's part of, <laughs> you know, what you do when you're at the bargaining table. We had reached, we didn't have a super union busty law firm, but you know, all corporate law firms that, you know, negotiate for yeah. companies are just different shades of union busty. I mean, we didn't have to deal with Jones Day, which is notorious in the industry as just being like awful from, from the get-go. But, you know, they did, they would do passive aggressive things like not schedule any bargaining dates to drag things out and wear the unit out so that people would begin to just tell us to wrap up the contract, even though we felt there were things in the contract that were weak. And we would do things like we had reached one point in the final summer that we were bargaining where we were looking ahead at a three month period and we had literally like three days of bargaining on the schedule and, you know, we're trying to wrap up the contract. And so we published a calendar that we distributed internally and put on social media that showed all of the days we were available to bargain and how many days the company was willing to bargain. And it had like three squares blocked out, whereas ours was like <laughs> wide open. And that got like a bunch more days on the table. You know, part of it is, you know, being active in the unit and also using the tools that we have as journalists, you know, social media, graphic design, like we have great graphic designers at the LA Times and some of the designs, you know, we're like, let's use the tools of the internet in the way that they are intended to be used, like meme cards, uh, digital graphics, people, people could put on Instagram and Twitter, oh, okay. um, things that could be like read in instantaneous ways and that would put public pressure on the company to just come to the table and <laughs> deal with us already. Like we did, we did all of that combined with live, of course, actions within um, the newsroom, you know, standing outside the A1 meeting and shaming all the editors, <laughs> some of their, their policies, but that those kinds of tactics were really important in terms of getting those kinds of firms to, you know, That's getting them to relent on those tactics. And there's also just a story, right? Starting a union in this climate I would say in particular, maybe in, during the Trump years, but given just the, the downsizing of, of US journalism in general, it's like a classic David and Goliath story. That's, I think it's very appealing. It's a good story to tell. Um, I mean, what we do have is we, as journalists, is we have this megaphone, you know, and we're good communicators. Yeah. So it's like that really, I think what sets us aside, somebody had asked earlier, what makes these unions different from like other industries is we really have these tools at our immediate disposal that make it very easy to communicate what it is we we want to do and perhaps shame them and do things in ways that for other unions, you know, they don't necessarily have a graphic designer on staff that they can turn to and be like, hey, can you whip out some meme cards so we can embarrass the lawyers? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> having that is pretty, is pretty great. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. Built-in communications department. Um, any last questions? We are a little over an hour and I'd love to hear from any of the students, anybody, just speak up. I, I've got a quick question, uh, can y'all hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would just love to hear you know, a handful of, of good resources uh, for folks who are, are interested in, in a possible drive, where to start, where to kind of best wrap your head around, what it might look like, frequently asked questions, that sort of a thing. Um, anyway, yeah. Where to start? 
I mean, I have to plug newsguild.org. <laughs> that would be the, the first place to start. I also think it is worth reading uh, any book by Jane McAlevey, but particularly No Shortcuts would be a great place to begin talking about like how to build a really member-led union. Hmm. Great. No Shortcuts. By, say her uh, name again, please. Jane McAlevey. Jane McAlevey. Okay. I don't want to plug in the Amazon link because <laughs> I'm boycotting <laughs> Amazon, but I'll, uh, I'll put the title here. Cool. Any, any last questions? Anybody? No. I think, you know, to add to Murphy's, uh, to add to Christina's answer to uh, Murphy, I believe uh, is her name, <laughs> if I have it correct, um, is in thinking about organizing, and I think part of the reason the LA Times, the, the last LA Times unionization uh, effort worked where maybe others had failed is I think there was a deep conscientiousness on behalf of the organizing committee of making sure that the people doing the organizing were really reflective of all different concerns uh, in the newsroom. So making sure there was a photographer, making sure there was a video journalist, making sure that there were writers, making sure that there were older journalists along, because this was a charge that was initially led by the younger journalists, making sure that older and middle-aged journal like me, <laughs> like were involved because we could all reach different, our different constituencies um, much more effectively. Uh, I remember when I joined part of it, you know, one of, one of the harder parts had been getting more of the, the journalists, the older and middle-aged journalists, you know, who are thinking about job security and mortgages and maybe they have kids in school and might be a little reticent to unionize. You know, I would often talk to them because it was kind of like, look, we're doing this for that very security. If you get laid off from your job tomorrow, what does the company owe you under a situation where there is a contract or there is no contract? It's two weeks pay versus maybe what, maybe months of buyout if, if you're represented by a union. So really starting to think about the issues mm. that affect all of these different constituencies and how you can best speak to them. That's great. Awesome, well, oh, are there any, is there one more question? Did I see a hand go up or are these the old hands? I think they're the old ones. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. This has been super informative and just inspiring really. Uh, thank you all for, for coming and for your questions and thoughts. Um, I hope to follow up with, with some resources at some point. Um, and um, yes, I will, be, I will be sharing a lot of these tips with, with our union as well. So thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day. Good luck. Thank you. And students.